Hey everybody, we are going to do the next three chapters of Game of Thrones. We only have six more to go. So three more after this one. One more video. We have this video and one more to go and we'll be done with the book. Okay, we are on to Sansa's chapter and she is not doing very well, of course, because she was there and saw her father be beheaded. So she's in her room in bed. She won't leave the bed. Um, they're bringing her food to her room. She's not touching any of it. She's even thought about killing herself and throwing herself out of the window, but changed her mind and went back to bed. Finally, Joffrey actually comes and visits her to her room and tells her, okay, get up, get out of bed, get dressed and bathe. You're coming to court with me today. And she's like, I don't want to go to, no, I'm going to stay here. Please let me, you know, let me stay in bed. Leave me alone. And he's like, no, you're going to behave like a betrothed should behave and you're coming to court and she's like you promised to be merciful to my dad and he's like I was merciful he's a traitor and I gave him a merciful death because to him I guess that is merciful for it to some any normal person other than like the mad king would know that you behead someone their family's not going to be happy about that in his mind he's like I gave him a clean death what's wrong with you get up he's just being an asshole like he's just evil. Um, she doesn't want to get out of bed. He orders the hound to pick her up and get, get her out of bed. And he tells her to get dressed. She says that uh, she hates him and that's when he, you know, tells Sir Marin to slap her. So, so Sir Marin smacks her around a couple times. Her lip is bleeding. She's all upset. He's like, you're gonna, gonna come to court. And the hound tells her, listen, just give him what he wants. Like you're supposed to. He's warning her that this is gonna happen a lot more if you aren't just compliant. So they're at court, people are coming to Joffrey for sentencing and all that stuff, um, or to ask for things, like people in the city come to the king and ask for things or ask him to sol solve quarrels or whatever, and he's being as horrible as we expect him to. Two guys, men are fighting over land, I think, and he is ordering them to like a duel to the death over it, like, he's just horrible. One lady came to ask for forgiveness for like her son or her husband who was a traitor and he said if she's begging for forgiveness and she must be a traitor too so he locks her away in the dungeon. Like he's just horrible. And Sansa's staying there she's realizing that what Peter Beta uh, told her was correct that uh, one day she's going to realize that life isn't just a bunch of sweet words and you know fairy tales and she's realizing that to her very very much discontent. So finally Joffrey's done being an asshole for the day and he has Sansa follow her and she realizes that he's taking her up to see where all the beheaded heads are. Um, she's like, no, please don't make me go. He's like, you're going to come up there or I'll make Sir Marin make you come. And the Hound tells her, just, just, just go. Like he's, he, he's trying so, it's, it's much more evident in the books that he is trying to help her. In the books, it's like, he's, he's trying to help her. He's like, listen, just listen to him. Do what he says or it's going to be worse. I'm sorry, but in the show, it was just, the few interactions they had, it was just creepy. He was just looming over her, being all dark and sullen, and it was creepy as fuck. And people were like, you don't understand that he's, you know, he's trying to help her. Yeah, if you read the book, you understand that, but I did not, like, he was not, it was not evident. To me, I was like, what is wrong with you? Anyway, he is clearly on her side and trying to help her out during this whole thing because even though she's waking up now to the harsh realities of the world, she's still slow at, you know, understanding how she should behave and what she should do. So he shows her, of course, her father's head, and then he shows her her septa's head, and, she, and Sansa says, you know, why did you kill her? She's God's sworn. And he's like, because she was a traitor. Like, I just, his kid? And then Joffrey says, um, maybe I'll give you something for my name day. Maybe I'll give you your brother's head as a gift and she says maybe he'll give me yours and then he has Sir Marin hit her again and Joffrey says you know you shouldn't be crying all the time you're much prettier when you smile and laugh you are a dick and a half and I'm going to murder you in your sleep I would murder him in his sleep you know I feel like no one around here had any initiative because Marjorie could get past guards and go see Tommen later on when she wanted to so I don't know why anyone else could do that Joffrey Anyway, so Marin hits her, her lip is bleeding again, and um, the hound walks up to her and hands her a handkerchief to wipe her mouth and tells her to keep it. He really is trying to, like, be there for her. I like him so much more now. I, like, I love, I start, I, I, I fell for him in the show, like, he won me over, but, like, 
I love him from the beginning now. <laughs> and that's all for Sansa. Okay, so we are on to Danny's chapter, and she's not doing so well. I feel like every chapter has begun with, okay, and this person hasn't isn't doing so well. She is drifting in and out of sleep. Um, she's having these really, really vivid dreams where she's a dragon and she's flying. She's dreaming about her brothers. Uh, she says Rhaegar mounted on a horse, and she keeps hearing... Um, the last dragon, he's the last dragon. She hears Viserys' voice, you don't want to wake the dragon. Like, she's having all these dragon-ish dreams going on right now. And she's waking up and asking for water. They're telling her she needs to sleep. And she's, I mean, she's in and out of it for a very, very long time. You can tell from just the context. She finally wakes up, um, one time and asks for a dragon's egg, uh, to hold. And they bring her one. And she... And she just backs to sleep. And finally, when she does wake up, she's out of it for so long that she finally wakes up and asks for water and a bath. And then she kind of really wakes up and asks about Khal Drogo. And the maid says, you know, that he is alive, but she's a little apprehensive to say anything else. So Danny asks for Jorah, and he comes in to see her. Jorah tells her that her son didn't live and that he died during the childbirth. Danny kind of you know, accept it. I think she knows that, you know, it's true. She asks him to feel one of the dragon's eggs and he says that, you know, it's hard, it's cold, it has scales. And she's like, is it hot? Is it warm? And he's like, no, it's cold. Which is strange to her because she feels heat in the eggs when she touches them. She asks about her son and the witch lady says that he was twisted. He had wings and scaly skin. Uh, it, yeah, he wasn't he wasn't healthy. Danny says, um, my baby was alive and well when I came into the tent. I felt him kick, you know, I was going into labor. She's like, the witch is like, yeah, but you came into this tent and death was in this tent and I warned you not to enter this tent. And Jorah says, um, I saw you dancing with shadows, just shadows, but you can tell he's kind of like not really buying exactly what he's saying. And the witch lady says, you know, well, the grave casts long shadows, and no light can hold it back. Like, like I, I told you not to come in here. And you did. I'm sorry. Danny says, you warned me that only death could pay for life. I thought you meant the horse. And the lady says, um, are you, are you sure? Like, that's the lie you told yourself. You knew what the price was going to be. So Danny asks to see, um, called Drogo. They take her outside, and she sees that the whole Kalasar is gone. And he reminds her that the cow, the riders, they only follow people who are strong. And Khal Drogo fell from his horse. And they tell her that once Khal Drogo died, that uh, Jago became the new call. And um, she asks about her maid that she had saved from before. And they say that, you know, once Danny fell, they took her and raped her and then killed her. So they finally take her to Drogo. And he's sitting alone in the sun just kind of unresponsive and they tell her that he seems to like the sun um <laughs> that's heartbreaking <laughs> it, it really kind of is and she wants to know and she says you know he was laughter and smiled and riding his horse when is he going to be like he was and she says when you know the sun rises in the east west and sets in the east whatever uh, and she's like this isn't life you told me he would have life i don't why would you do this? I saved you. And she's like, you didn't save me. I had already been raped when you came along. Like, and your son was going to be the stallion who mounted the world. He would have burned more cities. They would have raped more people. Like, you didn't save anyone from anything. Danny realizes that he's not going to come back. You know, it's, it's probably a hard realization, but she knows based on what the witch said that she can't, and she can't lug him around like that like what is she going to do so she takes him to the tent she has um a bath her maids bathe her she bathes Khal Drogo by himself and dresses him and he can kind of like follow he's not completely just like limp he can walk and follow so she leaves him outside and makes love to him for the last time like not like regular I mean she just had a baby she can't exactly do that but she's done she leaves him back to um, the tent and has him lay down on the bed and she, you know, tells him that she'll always love him when the sun rises in the west and sets in the east and then she takes a pillow and smothers him to death. It's so sad. Who would want to have to do that, you know? We are on Tyrion's chapter and we are in council with Tywin and all the lords in the mountain and, uh, 
Tywin is pissed because Jamie has been taken, of course. Uh, there's a Lord, Sir Swift, or maybe a knight, doesn't matter, um, who says that, you know, he's asking why the heck Jamie would split up his army into three groups because obviously that would make them more vulnerable. But Uncle Kevin is there. Tyrion's pissed because he's like, how dare you be questioning my brother? He doesn't say anything, but he's like pissed off that this Swift guy is questioning Jamie's, you know, tactics or whatever because Tyrion loves his brother. Uh, Uncle Kevin says, listen, you don't know the Riverrun lands like I do. He pretty much had no choice other than to split them up because of the way the things are situated there. So, so shut the fuck up. And there's a courier there and he's defending Jamie saying that, you know, he had no choice. He had sent people out and they really weren't expecting to see the Stark people coming towards them or whatever. And the mountain's there and he says, you know, what about your outriders that are supposed to be warning you about things? What the heck were they doing this whole time? And the guy says, um, the people, like, we were losing people for days. And the people who had come back, they hadn't seen anything. And the mountain says, you know, the people who don't haven't didn't see anything they have no use for their eyes so the next person who comes back and who hasn't seen anything you take his eyes out of his head and give them to the next guy as a warning and Tywin kind of looks over at the mountain and Tyrion doesn't know if it's like approval or disgust because that's gross but I mean you have to have fear in your people sometimes I guess I don't know who knows with Tywin uh, this is really showing like Tywin is just sitting there like listening to his people talk before he comes up with what he wants to do, which is how you should rule people sometimes, you know, you like listen to what everybody has to say and then you put your foot down and tell them this is what we're doing. I What I really get from these chapters with Tyrion and Tywin also is that the mountain is really integrated in the Lannister army. Like from the show you don't, like they say that the mountain is a Lannister person or whatever but you don't really get that he is a part of their strategy he has a say in what happens he leads a brigade in war and battle and like they kind of depend on him a little bit like he, I mean he's a big guy and he knows how to fight but he really does have a say in what goes on and how they do things and I don't feel like you really got that at all from the show like he was just like a big guy who fought but he has a voice in their system, I guess. So they're sitting there talking about you know, they had a battle on the river and how that all went down. Um, great John Umber came and found Edmure Tully in chains and like ran off with him. So yay, Edmure is free. Um, and it basically comes down to they got ambushed and they suck. So of course they're all talking about making peace in this situation because Rob Stark has the upper hand. They have Jamie now and they're saying maybe if we trade um, the sisters for Jamie and they're like, they're not going to trade Jamie for two girls. Like, they're not going to do that. He's winning right now. And someone, I think Sir Adam says, you know, two battles don't make a war, but he's still winning. Someone says they can ransom him and, and, and Tyrion says if they need money, they can melt down his armor. They don't want money. You just behead their Lord of the North, Guard of the North. That's not what it's called. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you just beheaded Ned Stark. Come on. They aren't going to trade Jamie for anything right now. They want everything. Um, so they're all going back and forth and Tywin's like, they have my son. That's the only two things he said. He said that once at the beginning of the chapter, they have my son who's pissed. And then this time he like yells it. That's it. That's all he said during this whole exchange. So he sends everybody out except for Tyrion. So Tywin gets him up to date and tells him that they have a new king. And Tyrion's thinking that something's happened to Joffrey. He's like, no, Joffrey is still on the throne. But uh, now King Renly has aligned himself with Highgarden and has married Margaret and... Margaret? And has married Marjorie and now that they are, they're going to march on King's Landing. He says that his daughter has commanded them to march to King's Landing to protect them from <laughs> from Highgarden, not Highgarden, from King Renly. And he's like, commands us. Can you believe this shit? My daughter, Cersei, is commanding me to do something. Which, I mean, she is really worried right now because she has Stannis coming and Renly and Robb Stark and Jaime was just taken. Like, she's nervous as hell right now. I get that. But, but Tywin's like, uh, this girl. Tyrion wants to know how Joffrey took the news and Tywin says that Cersei hasn't even told him yet because he might take it upon himself to go march on Renly himself because he's a 
fucking moron. So Tywin has decided that they're gonna go to Heron Hall. Um, he says that Sir Gregor is gonna go ahead of them to like basically clear the way and do whatever the heck they do. And he wants um, the mountain people to go with him, but Tyrion says he'd rather have them stay with him because he trusts them. Basically, he doesn't trust any of Tywin's people. Why would he? Tywin always wants him dead. And he knows that the mountain people are his people, so he can trust them. And Tywin says, okay, well, we can do that, but you better teach them a little bit of discipline because right now they're all over the place. And I'm sending you to the city. And Tyrion's like, what? He says, I'm going to send you to court to be the hand of the king. And Tyrion's like, what? Why me? And Tywin's like, uh, you're my son. And I need someone there and you're smart. So, I mean, he doesn't really say, he doesn't say he's smart. Why would he compliment him? I'm just saying we know that's why it is. He's saying, you know, Joffrey is out of control and he doesn't know what he's doing. And Cersei can't control him. So he's sending Tyrion there to try to like balance out his dumbness. And then Tywin says, one more thing, you're not, you're not going to take that whore to court. Which means he knows about Shay, so he's keeping tabs on him. And Tyrion leaves and goes directly to his tent where Shay is and he's like, I think I'm taking you to court. <laughs> Even in the books, Tywin is fun to read. You know, you don't get any insight on what he's really thinking or what, I mean, unless he says it, obviously, but you, you don't really get much from him. But he's still, he's fun to read too. I wonder if that was intentional. Like Tyrion, of course, we love Tyrion. We love all the main characters. But like, Tywin's fun to read. All right, that's it for today. I will see you soon. Have a good weekend.